Welcome everyone and happy Hanukkah. We are lucky enough to have the gift of Dr. Nomi Seidman's presence with us today. Uh, before we dive into that, let me say a few words about the GTU WSR Certificate Program and this new series, WSR Speaks. So the Certificate in uh, Women's Studies and Relig Religion, or WSR, um, is open to all GTU enrolled students. And uh, you take a core seminar. This year it'll be offered in the spring, so the WSR seminar. And then you take um, three additional courses that have a focus on women and gender topics um, and, and or methods. And then uh, students also have the option of writing their final paper for a course um, to count that would get evaluated by the uh, faculty on the steering committee for WSR. In addition, students are required to attend events that are designated as co-curricular events. So this is um, one of those events and it is worth two units. So um, the requirement is six units, so typically three events. And there's an event write-up that goes along with that requirement. So if you're interested, you can check out our website, just gtu.edu slash WSR to find out more about the certificate if you are a GTU student. Our events are always um, open to everyone, so we do hope that um, if you've enjoyed this and you want to get on our uh, email list, that um, you just can email us at wsr at ses.gtu.edu and we'll add you to our event email list. Um, if you missed our November event, which was WSR Speaks with Dr. Inez Radson's about feminist philosophy and Simone Weil, um, please see our GTU WSR YouTube playlist. All right, so now I am so honored to introduce our guest, Dr. Nomi Seidman, Chancellor Jackman Professor of the Arts at the University of Toronto. She will be speaking with us today about moder modernity and Orthodox Jewish girls culture. First, I would like to thank you so much for being one of our founding faculty members of the 2006 charter, which began the GTU WSR certificate program. So thank you so much um, for being part of what we are today. Um, so I would like to begin with you sharing your thoughts on the continued importance of women's studies and religion more broadly in this particular time. So a time of political and cultural climate uh, problems, catastrophes, some might say crises, white supremacy, racism, anti-Semitism, pandemics, global warming, et cetera, from your perspective as a scholar of Judaism, um, and then we'll focus um, on your research um, moving forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's so wonderful to see WSR continuing and growing and, and just being alive. And, you know, what a great question. And I, it's definitely one that I think all of us um, are asking ourselves now. And, I mean, if you're working, it really seems as if the two great topics of our day are um, the reckoning around uh, racism in the United States, and I'm in Canada, and it's not not an issue here, um, and climate change. I mean, it really seems like, why are we talking about anything else in this kind of emergency? Um, and I mean, I've, I, I've actually, I'm one of these people that's, you know, is dealing with the kind of feeling of end times around climate change and wondering, you know, what it is that 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 my little work has to offer and why I'm not just working on on those things. And I mean, one of the things that I sometimes tell myself is that um, the global catastrophe that we're facing the 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 the, the catastrophe of of a, a a planet that that seems to be dying in irreversible ways um is also about the kind of beauty of the world that we live in and that doing the work of saving the planet also means caring for the planet and it also means caring for the kind of diversity that that exists on it. Um, I, who is it? My friend Alyssa Sampson says, "No planet, no Jews." Right? Um, no Jews, no. You know, maybe it's not no Jews, no planet, but it's no planet, no Jews. I mean, it, it isn't just the extinction of species of flora and fauna that we're thinking about, but also 
just the amazing diversity uh, of life on this planet. And I actually had a hard time like, thinking about why is this important? And I think that that's not a surprise because these are, you know, this is the world that I grew up in and this is the world of Orthodox Jewish girls and, and, and women. And you're not taught to believe that you're important. And um, even you know, this school system that I'm, I'm gonna describe to you was, was sort of seen as a little bit of a joke, even in the Orthodox world. Oh, the girls, that's what they do. Um, and it just seems as if this is a moment, I mean, it's a moment of Black Lives Matter, but it's a moment of, of also seeing, you know, what else has been ignored and considered to not matter. Um, I won't use the term all lives matter, obviously, that's not what I mean. But I just mean that, that there's something precious about the life forms um, that we study um, in, in, in the past, they're, they're all calling out to us to be redeemed. Um, and in my case, it was, you know, a, a, a culture that's not taken seriously, and maybe it's not even taken seriously in the academy, right? This is not, you know, subversive women. This is Orthodox women, ultra-Orthodox women. Who's interested in that, right? Who's inter they're just reproducing a patriarchal culture or whatever the stereotype is. So I'll just say that the question of why this is important is to more than just me, you know, remains an open one, but, but I don't think it's a, it's a pointless question to ask about this particular research topic. Thank you so much. And I do wanna um, remind, I should have reminded earlier, um, everyone, we're, the first half, we're gonna be, I'll be dialoguing with, um, with Nomi. And then the second half is gonna be open for discussion. So if questions come up for you during, then please feel free to put them in the chat and we'll start with those when we open up and it's gonna be open um, discussion for the second half of the event. Um, so um, please do um, note your questions in the chat or just know that there'll be space for them. Um, thank you so much for those words. I think um, it touches on, definitely I resonate with that. I'm constantly asking like, why? Why does anybody care about, why should anybody care about what I'm doing right now with my scholarship when I'm dealing with ancient works um, in a time of, um, that's filled with so much, so many intersection um, crises. And, um, and it really has shaped the way that I approach my research in a way that um, is more intentional because I'm, I'm constantly thinking about um, why would anybody read about this other than like the five people that care about the civil, you know, like, you know, like, um, and so thinking about reframing. So I think that this discussion is going to be wonderful to, for me to learn more about your book and your work. So could you tell us more about your recent book, um, Shara, Sarah Schneider, Schneerer and the Base Yaakov Movement, A Revolution in Name Only? Could you let us know about this educational system and Sarah's role? It's actually a revolution in the name of tradition. Oh, oh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, no. I, um, I so, got this on the internet. <laughs> that's what it Let says on the internet. Oh my God. Yes. I'll, send the, I'll, I'll send you. I'll send you news. I've heard. Yes. <laughs> anyway, um, so my research is basically about this. Um, network of ultra-Orthodox girls' schools. So school, you know, everybody knows about ultra-Orthodox Jews and they're all men, right? They all have black hats and black suits and they gather in big seas of black. And presumably they were born of women and there must be some women, but presumably the women are, I don't know, in the kitchen or in the bedroom or wherever one imagines them. But as a matter of fact, there's an entire story to be told about ultra-Orthodox Jewish women. Um, the culture in which I myself grew up. And one of, I think, the really interesting things about these, um, these girls is that some huge proportion of this population of ultra-Orthodox girls attend a school system called Beis Yaakov, which was founded in 1917 um, by a, a seamstress with an eighth grade education named Sarah Schneerer. And writing a book about Sarah Schneer, you hear her name mangled in many different ways. So that's one of the pleasures of talking about Sarah Schneer. And this is what I mean, nobody would, the only people who remember this 
this woman are graduates of the system. So in Sarasnera's own lifetime, there were already hundreds of schools um, under this name. Um, it was already an international system by the 1930s. At this point in time, it, it not only exists, but thrives in 13 countries with at least 1300 girls schools. And these schools are not organized in any kind of official way. In other words, anybody can open up a Besiakov school anywhere in the world. There are five in Buenos Aires. There are five in Toronto, for instance. Um, the only thing that unites these schools other than their ultra-Orthodox is that they, they're all, they all remember um, Sarah Schneer, their founder, the, this founding woman who, to give you a sense of what I mean, it's not just that she's remembered, these girls consider themselves the daughters of Sarah Schneer. You're a Basia, if you ever went to Beis Yaakov, you're a Beis Yaakov girl to the end of your life and all other Beis Yaakov girls anywhere in the world are your sisters. And on any given night in the week, there's a, a grave, her, she died in 1935. Her grave site was the cemetery in which she was buried was destroyed by the Nazis, but it, um, in 2000 and in the beginning, I forget exactly when, there were 2001, 2002, a group of graduates of the school system reconstructed a, a grave site, which is now a um, pilgrimage destination for girls and women who come and pray at this gravestone. And people are continually sending me photos of them, you know, at every night, doesn't matter how much snow there is, there are people praying and dancing around and singing around this woman's tombstone. And, um, on the 10th anniversary of each, you know, on her, the 80th anniversary, the 90th anniversary, the 90th, 90th anniversary of her death is coming up in a few years. And every time this happens, it's um, celebrated, observed in greater and greater numbers. So for instance, in for the 80th anniversary of Sarah Nera's death, there were 30,000 girls and women who assembled in the Barclays Center in Brooklyn and elsewhere all around the world to remember this woman. And yet in, you know, because this is a girl's school system and because for some reason, Orthodox girls are invisible in the popular culture, unless they're leaving Orthodoxy, in which case you can have a Netflix series around it. Um, this, the fact that there is a, a women's culture that's distinct in many ways from the men's culture, but that in, in certain ways resembles it, including through mass gatherings and through pilgrimage to grave sites, um, is, is not only unknown to the general public, but even within the Orthodox world is just not considered important because who cares what the women are doing? So um, this has been my, uh, you know, I wrote a book, here's a copy of my book. Um, I could, talk more about it but so I've been researching this book the the first book published in 2019 is mostly about the interwar pioneering years of the system and the opposition that arose to it and the pioneering spirit of it and um, the next book that I write about it will be particularly about the performance culture of, of the girls schools. Thank you. That's so rich. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about um, the differences that you've experienced in through your research of these different communities. And then, you know, I love this idea of kind of the sorority, basically, that has created this, this focus on sisterhood, um, yet their experiences being so different. And that's and the similar, I mean, Jewish identity is, it's so diverse. <laughs> and yet then there's these, um, these ties, these threads that then um, create um, a shared tradition. And so I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more um, towards ways in which you've seen that diversity, but then um, how you've seen that sisterhood kind of play out. You've mentioned pilgrimages and, and, and performance. Maybe you could give a little bit um, more example about what, how those groups come together and what, what's, happened when that's happened. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. So so one of the interesting things about Besyakov, I mean, I 
you know, I think it's all kind of interesting, but one of the really interesting things about it, and I'll talk about the performance culture in a minute, but is this notion of diversity and, um, and unity. And I don't want to um, exaggerate this. There are, there, so at this point, Beis Yaakov now encompasses both Sephardic, Mizrahi, Ashkenazi. In other words, there are um, many different Jewish ethnic groups who send their, their daughters to Beis Yaakov. And sometimes there's, this school has actually been accused of racism. Um, there's a case in 2010, I believe, in the Israeli Supreme Court, basically shut down a school for discriminating, for putting up a fence between, uh, in the middle of the school, including in the middle of the schoolyard to separate the Ashkenazic and the, and the Mizrahi students. Though what they said was that they were separating, the Mizrahi students tend to have a more lax religious um, approach to Jewish law. And the idea was that they were somehow infecting the Ashkenazic girls with their laxity in terms of religious observance. Um, and this case, when you can read about it, it's, it, it was, I mean, um, it was in the West Bank settlement of Emmanuel. So we haven't even talked about that. In other words, we're not talking here about a liberal culture, despite the sort of strands of feminism. I'm talking about a distinctly non-liberal culture. This is a group um, that, you know, I, I, I'm still doing research with people in this, in, in, inside this community. And when I asked them, oh, how do you keep putting on plays during COVID? They're like, oh, we all had COVID in April, 2020. So this is a, you know, a group that has not, based, you know, many of them did not follow health guidelines. They've been um, acute, correctly accused of racism. Racism in this community is one of the things I've been investigating and writing about um, and, and what racism looks like within uh, the Orthodox Jewish world in particular. So, um, and nevertheless, there's some kind of diversity in the sense that despite all these distinctions, despite the fact, so all the Hasidic groups and how they're all at odds with each other. And then the Hasidic groups versus the yeshivish groups who are another strand of ultra-Orthodoxy, um, you know, and then the ethnicities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, nevertheless, Beis Yaakov has always prided itself as being the one umbrella organization that encompasses all these groups. So if you wanna say, what is ultra-Orthodoxy? And somebody says, give, you, give me one, umbrella organization, people will tell you there isn't one. They Yaakov comes as close as anything does to encompassing the whole spectrum, the fractious spectrum of orthodoxy. And, you know, in terms of, in terms of what this means that all these girls consider themselves to be sisters and they come together in conventions. And one of the things on YouTube, if you Google Beis Yaakov convention, you'll see a group of different Beis Yaakovs from different places all came together to wrote a song and, you know, the camera keeps going, you know, the, the ones, you know, Beis Yaakov of Miami, they're not all called Beis Yaakov, by the way, and they're under the palm trees and they sing a line and then the ones in the snow sing a line. So there's this real sort of sense of the unity and diversity is a very big part of what Beis Yaakov is. Um, and an example of what it means that this is really one system is that um, in, in Buenos Aires, I just talked about Buenos Aires, which is one of the scenes I'm now, uh, um, with the help of a Spanish speaking research assistant, I'm now researching um, Beis Yaakov in, in Buenos Aires, there's a Syrian Beis Yaakov. So this is common where the people of a particular community will open a Beis Yaakov. And, um, I, in, I happened to interview a woman who was 24 years old, who was a graduate of the Syrian Beis Yaakov. And um, one of the things that I always ask the graduates is, do you, um, do you know any songs, Beis Yaakov songs? And she started, this woman started singing me a song. I had to tell her that there were no men in, in eavesdropping um, who could hear her because Orthodox women do not sing in front of men who are not uh, their immediate relatives. And she starts singing me this song and I went, oh my God, this is a song that I have a copy of the lyrics from 1931 and I didn't know anyone 
still sang this song. And somehow this song, which I, I have a songbook from the same year, 1931, that has the, the lyrics and the notes. But this was a song that I happened not to have the lyrics for. And the ones I have the lyrics for, I try to teach and, and try to revive in some way. I heard this, the tune for this song from a Syrian woman in Buenos Aires. Um, and I had the words from a newspaper, of, uh, from the school newspaper. There was a, the school newspaper was actually was called the Besiaco Journal, the longest running uh, magazine directed toward women, 159 issues between 1924 and 1939. And then there, were, there was an English version and a Hebrew version after the Holocaust. So um, that's what I mean by this. There's no doubt that this is one school system, despite for all the racism, I, I interviewed um, a graduate of the Beis Yaakov of Antwerp, which is actually one of the oldest surviving Beis Yaakovs. It may be the actual oldest surviving Beis Yaakov, interrupted only by the years of the Second World War. And she told me that her parents were um, not only not Ashkenazic, but also um, disabled. Both of her parents were deaf. And she was told, and she herself is not deaf, she was told that she would have to marry a disabled man because of her market value, which was, and she was so upset that she left Beis Yaakov and she's still Orthodox, but she left the school system. So, um, I mean, I like to talk about how amazing the school system is, but some of it is quite, you know, not, not a beautiful story. In terms of the performance culture, that's, I think, very interesting. So. And one of the ways in which Beis Yaakov was totally different from, and one of the ways that all the boys in the Orthodox world make fun of the girls, which is that performance and plays and school song, the play, or what's called in North America, production um, is it's just production. What's, pre you know, production is a huge thing. And um, I mean, I knew production was, a, in other words, there are these elaborate performances that are, you know, that are rehearsed for months, if not years. Beis Yaakov of Baltimore, which is one of the like high-end Beis Yaakovs of the whole campus, they put one on once every two years because it takes two years to put one of these on. In other words, um, expensive tickets and everyone in the school and, and you know, auditions and et cetera. But one of the things that's, I mean, there's a few things that are very interesting about it to me, which is this goes back to the very origins of the school system. Sarah Schneer, the founder, along with being a seamstress, and you know, I found out a lot more about her. She was also theater crazy, not that unusual in Krakow of her time. And one of the first things she did when she assembled a group of kids in her dressmaking studio was to just put on plays, biblical plays and historical plays and um, and her plays were circulated throughout the system. And it was a big way that they attracted students. So students, students would clamor, girls would clamor to be in the this, this play, um, just be, not because they were interested in being religious, even from secular or atheist families, just because Desiakov was famous for its plays. Um, and the other aspect of this theater culture is that it's completely sexually segregated to the, this day. Um, so, and now it's not only plays, it's also films. And um, one of, I now have the, what I call the Beis Yaakov Project, which is a group of women, most of whom graduated from the school system or at least graduated, you know, who grew up within this Orthodox world. And one of them just uh, sent me as a Hanukkah present, it hasn't come yet, but, uh, a film, an all women's film called The Three Sarahs. You know, Sarah Schneerer, Sarah whatever, maybe the biblical Sarah that Sarah Schneerer is always being compared to, um, and some other Sarah who I didn't hear about. This is very typical to, and, and this is a film, a video. And there are summer camps for ultra-Orthodox girls where they learn, they put on a, a film and then the film is sold at Orthodox bookstores and all the films say on the cover for girls and women only. And they're basically all female productions. And from the beginning, there's always been a kind of, and generally there are a lot of male roles. Um, 
which means that a lot of girls get to cross dress, which is very exciting if the rest of your life you have to wear a long skirt down to the floor. And for instance, a big favorite in the repertoire, the Basiaco repertoire is Joseph and his brothers. Surprise, surprise, many boys roles, right? So many roles for girls. And one of the stories I found in the press when I was uh, you know, researching Basiaco and into our Poland was that these plays were not only super exciting for the girls, but that many boys wanted to get in on the action. And the girls, the boys would dress up like girls to sneak into the plays. And then they'd be watching girls dressed as boys on stage. So um, if anyone asks, this is an extremely queer phenomenon. Um, and this is still, you know, this is still the same. I mean, the rabbis are constantly trying to get women to stop posting videos of themselves rapping on YouTube. But you can Google Beis Yaakov performance plays and you'll see a lot of girls singing. They have not managed to control the um, social media. So this is a big, just in many, many different ways, this is kind of um, one of the failures of the Orthodox rabbinate to control women's lives. But the, in principle, the, the, the production and the, the singing and the, um, I now have a, a kind of Des Yaakov choir and we, we, we perform these songs in public, we put on concerts. It's all on my website, which I could show you. Um, and we, and generally it's no, it's women who are no longer Orthodox because we, um, women who are Orthodox would not perform in public, but, but only to other women, audiences of women. But there are women who, uh, one of my favorite Orthodox women who's still involved in Beis Yaakov is a woman named Leslie Klein, who's the principal of a teacher seminary, who uh, has an organization, who has a kind of, I don't know what it is, a kind of activist group called From Women Have Faces, Orthodox Women Have Faces, which boycotts Orthodox publications that don't show women's faces. And among her other activities is she has something called Girls' Night Out, where you can hear women perform and rap and um, do comedy. And she herself is a rapper. And you can hear her perform very angrily about the orthodox practice of erasing women's faces from, uh, from orthodox publications. Sorry, very long answers. No, that was amazing. I've been writing so many notes down of all these things. I would love you to, if you can, you could share screen um, briefly to show us your website. Also, please put it in the chat and then um, as well as um, any other resources. And when we send out the email um, for those that weren't able to be here today, we'll also put that in the email so that um, it's easy access um, for those on our email list to, to get access. Oh, God, I'm so YouTube. sorry. I don't know where it went. Give me one. Oh, here it is. Can you see that now? No, not not yet. So share, do you have share screen? Uh, I believe so, here it is. So, um, so this is a, uh, this is my website. It's called the Beis Yaakov Project. And it's basically designed to uh, collect all kinds of information about this school system. I should just say one thing about why I would need to do this. So. Um, many of these schools have no online presence um, because Orthodox Jews are not supposed to be on their, you know, screens. And uh, there's no central office anymore. So there's no place you can go. There's a, a very, there's a Wikipedia page. But basically our big project is just to map the system from beginning till end, till the end. So here's our team, people working on it. Um, Sorry, my computer's a little bit slow, but um, uh, you can see me, Pearl Gluck is, uh, we all went to the same Beis Yaakov. It's kind of the flagship Beis Yaakov in Borough Park, Brooklyn. 1500 girls in case, in case you're imagining something cozy. Um, and Dani on the left runs the website. Basia Schechter is a world musician who's making a record of the Beis Yaakov music that I'm finding in the archives. Pearl Gluck is a documentary filmmaker. She has a film about sex traffic. I think it's on Netflix right now. Um, she's also a professor at Penn State. She and I, she really is making a documentary film. So that's the project team. Um, 
sorry, my computer's so slow. Here's my archive. So I'm collecting photos of the school from the present to the, from the past to the present. This is um, the photo on, do you see the photo on the right? Bess Yalkov students in Buchach performed the play Joseph and his brothers. So one of the reasons why that's so precious to me is that um, my aunt, who you can't, maybe if I click on it, it'll become bigger. My aunt, who died in the Holocaust, who I never met, was uh, the Bess Yaakov teacher there. I believe that's my aunt on the left there. My uh, book is dedicated to her. Without my, no, my father died in 1995, so I don't know if that's her. The other reason I love this photo, other than it's just such an amazing photo, is that um, the major time for the production of these plays is actually this week, the Saturday night of Hanukkah, which is coming right up. Um, and the, uh, as you all know, tis the season. So many of these, uh, many of these girls, most of these schools were after school programs. Many of these girls may have been wearing the same costumes in their Christmas pageant as there, as you can see, there's like angels and it's all very Christmassy. And I have photos of, um, of Polish uh, plays from the same era that are, um, that look almost identical. Okay, let's see what else I can show you. Um, um, here's a photo of Bessie of Antwerp of 1936, as you can see, one of the still surviving. Um, this photo on the right, Bessie of Paris, uh, that was my mother's Bessie My mother, one of the things about Bessie is Sarah Schneer basically took graduates. Graduates meant you were the oldest person in the class. It didn't matter if you were 13, 14, 15, 16. And then she sent them off to found a school in some generally some town that was desperate for a school because some young woman had just joined the communist party. Um, please help us. Here, let me show you that uh, this is a my mother. This is during the second world war. This is 1941, I believe. Um, this is in a ghetto and this is my mother's Besiako uh, class. Um, there she is in the middle. My mother's 99 years old and uh, in the course of her life, ran uh, three or four different Besiakos. And as you can see, Besiakos were often not the way we think of as school. They're after school programs with girls of all ages, including girls that were older than my mother. She was probably 20 at this point. Um, her sisters are there on the top left. Her two sisters, one of them wearing a toga, because that's what you do when you're in Besiako, you wear a toga. Um, so let's see what else. And then along with, and maybe I'll just show you, um, this is the cover of my book, the summer program until 1931, teachers were trained for a few months over the summer in the woods. Um, nature was a big deal. The photo on the right here um, is the founding uh, conference of the Orthodox Women's Organization that Besiaka was instrumental in founding. For, so for adult women, basically, they also had a youth movement. And what this meant is that by 1929, Orthodox girls were enveloped within this interlocked set of, of organizations from the cradle to the grave. Um, anyway, check out my website. There are many, many, many more um, photos. And each one you click on and you get as much as I can find. Let me show you what else you have here. Um, music, I, I already mentioned, maybe I'll play, uh, well, here's, you know, the songbooks I found and the various, um, oh, it's not loading too quickly, but, um, you know, you can hear, you can hear groups of girls and women singing these songs. I have Besiakov material objects. Um, let's see what I have there. Um, a stamp that was used in the Israeli part of the system, uh, what's called a pushka, a charity box, an apron, uh, a, what's called a bencher, grace after meals, another charity box, um, et cetera. So uh, from all around the world, I don't have many material objects now, but I'm continuing to collect. 
I also blog about all kinds of things. I mean, it's not just me. Um, a suicide at the teacher seminary in the, in the 1930s. Here's a blog about my mother and me, uh, my 99 year old mother talking about Beis Yaakov, um, the different ways that Sarah Schneer is depicted in different um, schools. In the Syrian schools, they tend to put a lot of makeup on her. Um, I do these close readings of, uh, of photographs. So this particular photograph I've stared at for a very long time and written a lot about, tried to parse what it is. As you see there's a scratched out figure in the back um, that I spend a lot of time wondering about. So, okay, maybe I'll stop my share. And um, sorry, my video seems to, oh, here we are. I'll restart my video and um, I'm not entirely sure how to put the, um, let me see if I can figure out how to, okay, let me put something in the chat. I've never actually put anything in the chat before, believe it or not. Uh, this so will get you that... to uh, yeah. uh, uh, my blog. Wonderful. And that was, that's an amazing website. We will include that in our um, email out as well as on Facebook. Thank um, you. I think we're going to open it up for questions, but I do want to just um, note how important basically all, you've talked about so much and what really resonated with me and came out um, is how intersectional this is in a way that is emblematic of um, when we talk about um, intersectional feminism in in general, right? Because there is um, this, these different oppressions that are happening. There's infighting that happens in between. There's racism, there's sexism. There's all of these different layers um, of different, of how um, different people that identify as feminist or as um, related to feminism in, in some way, um, how how they define themselves against the other, which isn't always against uh, a masculine or um, the kind of a cis heteronormative um, uh, world, you know, and so how we're aligning or um, unaligning with um, patriarchy. I think that, that it, this raises up so many, it's a great case study um, for all of that. Also then, um, so we can see how those kind of oppressions that get, they can get um, subverted is also was um, reinforced, which you had mentioned. I think that that's um, that's also something that we always have to be remain so critical of ourselves within our lenses within women's studies and religion. How are we um, how are we pushing boundaries? How are we reinforcing them? And then, but also the beauty and the fact that you mentioned that um, this movement is the is the only one in which the kind of fracturous spectrum of orthodoxy has a larger identity um and and that the power and the fact that that happens within a, a female space within a, a, a woman's a, a gendered space that is not within that system that um masculine space that is um that's projected as being so in control and so actually that lack of control of that lack of the fact that there is so much diversity um in the curriculum and in locations and how um how they are their founding how Sarah um, is envisioned um, how it's performed there's so much diversity in that yet there's um, there's there's unity and I think that that's really beautiful um, and really does shine a light I think it, it shows the importance of this within just thinking about larger systems um, as well I think that it, it becomes a microcosm of so much so much debate um, that is currently um, in in so many discussions around intersectionality and feminism, you know, you've touched on disability, you've touched on um, racism and so many, so many other things. So thank you for highlighting this because um, I think that it's, it really brings out so many reasons why women's studies and religion is important today um, and, and how we can look to different communities to, um, to, to learn, you know, to learn and to, to continue to try to make and create just and sustainable communities and what, what is beautiful about them and, um, and, and transforming and what we can um, take, take from that um, in, in positive ways and what we can learn from in the ways that, that there's still the stumbling. So thank you so much. I'll just say that Sarah Schneer herself was uh, you know, obviously a religious maverick who basically created her own religious system 
And along with theater, the other thing that she really loved was nature. And a huge part of what Beis Yaakov was were these kind of mystical nature hikes. Uh, hand in hand, 120 girls up to the top of a mountain and at the top of the mountain, pray the morning prayer. That was Serge Neres, that was what she considered religion to be. So if we had a little bit more of that in Beis Yaakov, um, it would, remembering that I think is also important. Oh, thank you. That's beautiful. The memory has definitely been a key theme in this. Um, and I think it's, it's yeah. very powerful. So I'm going to move to the um, to the chat and also um, please now everyone this is open so if you have questions you can use the raise your hand um, or just speak out you can ask the questions on your own I'm going to speak the question that is in the chat could you tell us more about the story of the founder and the source of the name of the school so thank you so much for asking that so it's such a tricky question about Sarah Nira because um, the stories that are told about Sarah Schneer within Beis Yaakov, they're told, many stories are told about her um, and songs are sung about her. So it's not, she's, she's, you know, extremely well known, but her story is censored and massaged to fit in with contemporary Orthodox um, values. For instance, she was divorced, but the way she's described is this is uh, more or less, you know, in these words, in, you know, hundreds of schools all around the globe, people are saying, Sarah Schneer, like our mother, Sarah, in other words, the foremother, Sarah, um, was, um, you know, unfortunately never had children. Um, but every Beis Yaakov girl today is her daughter. So her divorce is just unmentioned unmentionable and as a matter of fact she was considered to be i mean i've found memoirs of people who you know who knew her who say that when she walked around um krakow people referred to her as the divorcee oh there goes the divorcee um she was con she was a kind of visible freak um in a society in which divorce was really frowned upon in the orthodox world in the ultra orthodox world she was the divorced woman and she never took her husband's name um so and that's another thing that's not really spoken about um what i discovered was a polish diary um in other words she wasn't even writing in yiddish the jewish vernacular she was writing in polish um that describes her going to plays and going to public lectures about um, birth control. Um, and so the whole picture of who she was is extremely, is very different from what I was taught. Um, and we're still finding out more about who she was. But the other thing that I discovered about her is that when the school system was taken over by the organized Orthodox world in 1925, they more or less tried to, after, there were already 44 schools at that point. The school had been in existence for eight years and there were 44 schools, all done single-handedly by this woman. Um, and they tried to expel her from the system and she wouldn't leave. They raised a bunch of money in the United States and built a school system. And, you know, they, they moved all the girls out from under her. They started the summer program. She shows up. Um, she was a kind of, she followed the girls. They, they, they moved the central office to Warsaw um, just to get it away from her. And they were basically the girls just wouldn't let her go. And finally it got to the point when even these men who are taught to disregard women who thought she was a freak. I mean, everyone thought she was a freak, um, but who had these like girls who were totally devoted to her um, they were forced to acknowledge her status as some kind of religious, as a kind of Hasidic Rebbe. They didn't use the, that term themselves, but there are all kinds of records of she would go to confer with the Hasidic Rebbe by the time the school system was finally accepted. And the rabbi would stand up for her, unknown of a rabbi standing up for a woman. And in the Polish press, it was very obvious to them that there was a woman rabbi um, and, you know, that she was treated like a saint 
and there were saint stories about her and there continue to be saint stories about her. There are all kinds of, and she's treated like a saint. I mean, that's what's going on around her grave every night of the year, certainly on Hanukkah, it's right now, you know. Um, and the, you know, the telling and the retelling of her story are very much in the tradition of Hasidic tales. And, you know, she supposedly saved people's lives during the Holocaust. They tried to destroy her tombstone and the ax broke, you know, all these magical stories about her. Um, the source of the name for the school um, is, and she's also very important in Holocaust memory, which is another whole thing that I haven't talked about, but this, the, the, so the, the name of the school is taken from a verse in Exodus at the beginning of the story of the giving of the Torah at Sinai, the same passage that Judith Plaskow talks about as being about the erasure of women, somehow this school decides is about giving the women the Torah. So it says, um, uh, so shall you say to the house of Jacob and uh, impart to the children of Israel. And rabbinic commentary believes that there's no unnecessary repetition, which is funny because there's plenty of unnecessary repetition, but that each one of the two halves of that verse must refer to some other, something different. So Rashi says about that verse, uh, so shall you say to the children of Jacob, to the house of Jacob, that is the women. Um, Beis Yaakov understood this to mean that the Torah was given to women first before it was given to the children of Jacob, whatever, to the children of Jacob. Wait, the house of Jacob, the children of Israel. So um, before it was given to the men, it was given to the women. Three days before the holiday of, of Shavuot, Shavuot, when the Torah was given, supposedly, um, Beis Yaakov had, had its own festival, which was its festival of the giving of the Torah to girls. And people would dance for hours around Sarishnir singing Kota Mar Levet Yaakov singing this song until they were in a kind of state. Um, this is described in all the memoirs, these kind of wild ecstatic dancing around Sarishnir and then, Sar uh, you know, with fires and then she would stand up and they would all go wild. Wow. That's amazing. I'm having this image of kind of like whirling dervishes. Um, yes, I could. If you, I have a blog about the 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 nighttime dancing. That's very evocative of of how it how how wild it was. Wonderful. I see Erica's hand. Hi. Thank you so much for this. Um, I have so many questions. I but I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about. Um, your sense from a contemporary standing of the role of these schools in resistance. Um, it just, it, it, it's so fascinating to me, you know, with all of these sort of like ways that you describe them being quite edgy and thinking about women's role in Judaism and, and education of women, like what, what result, like, why does the system stay within the Orthodox world? And why, um, and do you think it's related to this sort of wave of women leaving Orthodoxy um, because of the examples that they've seen? I mean, I, can you just talk a little bit about like women's schools, women institution as resistance and like where you think this is going within feminism and Judaism? <laughs> so Beis Yaakov, you know, it, it, a couple of things. First of all, th there are there are extreme ultra orthodox groups that will not allow their girls to go to Beis Yaakov. The other thing is that um, there's the one of the ways to understand Beis Yaakov is this concept by the Israeli literary critic Iris Parusha, the benefits of marginality. That one of the reasons why this was permitted is because Orthodox men, despite the fact that it says in the Talmud, you shouldn't teach a girl's Torah ever. One of the reasons it was permitted was um, because basically Orthodox Jewish men were, did not want to involve themselves in the lives of girls and women. So um, in other words, the benefits to people not caring what you're doing. 
Um, whereas if you're an Orthodox Jewish boy, your time is policed much more rigorously. Um, but also the Orthodox world was desperate. Um, the background to the founding of Beis Yaakov was a, a wave of defections of particularly Orthodox girls, including some very well publicized uh, defections. One of the 1909, the grand, two granddaughters of the Sanza Rebbe, so a, a Hasidic Rebbe in, in, in Krakow, not only leave the Orthodox world, but take their parents to court to sue them for support while they go to the university, Connor Kluger. And not only do they sue their parents, but all the students at the university rise up with them and um, march. There's a demonstration on behalf of these girls against the Hasidic world. Um, and this was hugely embarrassing. And the, the rabbis were desperate desperate for help, they themselves couldn't do anything because of what looked like a clear prohibition against teaching girls Torah. They could tighten the screws, they could, they forbade girls from leaving the house on the Sabbath. They um, took them out of schools after the age of, eight, of eighth grade. It didn't help. Girls were running away and leaving this, running away to a convent. Um, and the convent was like doors open for Jewish girls trying to escape arranged marriages. And there were many, many girls and the Hasidic world was in turmoil. And the Gera Rebbe, the, the 250,000 Hasidim, the largest Hasidic group in Poland, he said he had thousands of, of young boys who had no hope of finding a bride because of this wave of defection. So, Orthodox girls got power because of the ones that were defecting. So I always say to my Orthodox friends, I'm doing you guys a favor. All of us who leave are doing you guys a favor. To me, it's clear that this was to some extent a feminist revolution. I call it a revolution in the name of tradition. Um, but the the world that I'm talking about, the ultra-Orthodox world, is not the modern Orthodox world of women's Talmud study and prayer groups, definitely not. And they consider it to be the worst betrayal of the memory, the pious memory of Sarah Schneer, that these modern Orthodox or even progressive liberal conservative reform women remember Sarah Schneer. Um, they consider this the biggest betrayal of Sarah Schneer's memory. And when I was writing my book, my mother said, you're not going to call her a woman's liber, are you? They all know that that's what the rest of the world thinks of Sarah Schneer, and they all deny it vociferously. And I was very careful not to use the word feminist in that unquestioning way in my book, because I'm not going to impose something on, a, on I, you know, that's a kind of, let's say, intellectual colonialism. Um, and I talk for a very, you know, it's one of the things I consider, can this be called a feminist um, revolution? Can it be called resistance, as you call it? I give, I marshal as much evidence as I can for making that argument, but I just finally say, it's not up to me to say. It's what it is and what it isn't. I mean, there are also, there's someone like Leslie Ginsburg Klein, who isn't, you know, openly calls herself an orthodox feminist. So she's on the more modern, end of the spectrum. Um, you know, nobody in my school would have ever been called Leslie, for instance. So she, you know, she doesn't have a Jewish name. And actually in Beis Yaakov, they insisted on people using Jewish names only. So um, again, it's a spectrum, but um, this is a very highly charged um, debate. And one of my reasons for wanting to have a website is because people are encouraged to contribute and to argue. And periodically I post on social media that quite just to get people's blood pressure up was based off of a feminist school system. I mean, at this point, it's very hard to say that a school system that basically tells you that, that you have one path in life, which is to marry and support your husband while he studies Talmud, which was not what they were saying in the interwar period. It's very hard to call it a feminist uh, phenomenon now. 
Do you think, I'm sorry, just quick follow up. Do you, can you just talk about how it's funded? Like, do people who are running these schools feel obliged to Orthodox system funding? So the funding is very interesting. The funding is, um, in the interwar period, the funding came from, um, a lot of it came from what could be called the the um, the international network of mostly but not entirely Jewish um, fight against the international white slave trade. So it's interesting that you're that you're nodding because that may have come out of left field. But this when when the school system was founded, um, uh, the what what is called awfully the international white slave trade was in the news a lot. Um, this is, you know, sex trafficking, which both pimps and prostitutes or women brought into the system or whatever, were a very high percentage of Polish Jews for all kinds of reasons. And it's part of the whole phenomenon of girls leaving orthodoxy. And rumors were that these were orthodox girls that were being, you know, staffing the brothels in, in Argentina and, and, and um, South Africa and Istanbul. Um, and it's one reason why women like Eleanor Roosevelt were on the board of the Beis Yaakov. Beis Yaakov, I think this is mostly a fundraising strategy. So Beis Yaakov mined these rich Western European and American Jews who were embarrassed about the, um, and when in their fundraising literature, they call themselves the Society for Educating and Protecting Eastern European Jewish Girls and Women. And the word protecting was code for anti-sex trafficking. So this is where a lot of the funding comes from. Um, it came from, this is no longer the case. There's some government funding for Beis Yaakov now, but it's, you know, these are overpacked, under, you know, um, these are not fancy schools. So, uh, you know, the schools, you know, 35 girls packed into a classroom with teachers who just graduated high school, who, you know, go for months without getting a paycheck. I mean, we're not talking about, uh, you know, beautiful laboratories and etc. Some of them are the ones in out of town often are the Baltimore, as I said, has a beautiful campus. Toronto has a nice campus. But the ones you'll find, you know, the ones that I went to in Brooklyn, those are, you know, those are, uh, are, are you know, and as, as, as high as tuition, you know, and, and it, it's very difficult for Orthodox families, which tend to be very large, to pay for Orthodox education. And it's one of the big expenses of any kind of Orthodox family. And these schools are always threatening to go under. Every time I Google this Yakov Bar Park, I'm looking for another photo, my alma mater. They're like, if we don't hear from you today, we're gonna go out of business. Thank you so much. That even every, Every answer has just led to so many, opening up so many more facets of this, that it shows how rich this topic is um, and how it aligns with so many issues that are, um, that are of interest in women's studies and religion kind of across the board from so many different perspectives and avenues. And so um, I feel like you really, thank you so much for highlighting how, um, how this topic, I think you're, you're gonna have a lot more readers for your book um, hopefully, um, but definitely also of your, the resources on your website. So we will be sharing those as well. So, um, it is 101. Um, so we're going to be ending. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you Dr. for Seidman, having me for, and um, thank you for, for coming. Yes. Thank you all. And, um, yes, this will be available on the YouTube playlist for GTU WSR. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Elle. Thank you. Nice to see you. Wonderful questions.